Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle CX UX for B2B Leadership Forum. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our keynote speaker. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions during the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we'll address your questions at the end of the session. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Today we have Jim Ayub, Chief Customer Officer with eTech Global Services. We're excited to have Jim with us today for a keynote presentation called From Attrition to Mission, How Data and Purpose Stop the Revolving Door. Welcome, Jim. Over to you. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm really looking forward to today. Hopefully we'll have some fun. You guys can uh, ask a bunch of questions, but I'm just going to talk today a little bit about how you use data and using it to actually improve the performance, but also help with attrition. So, you know, when you think about data, you know, so why are people talking about data? A lot of people in the industry, it's this gut feeling, right? You know, um, people are making decisions based on biased information, which is a sampling set of calls, a handful, or perception of what you think is happening um, in, in your organization. But if you really use true data and make a crucial part of your business, it does give you that greater transparency. It opens room for this continuous improvement. It makes faster decision-making and gives you clear feedback. I recently read an article where one customer was saying, you must use the name of the customer throughout the conversation. Actually, we analyzed over 100,000 phone calls and found that it actually upset a majority of the people because they were like, oh, who are you to call me by my first name? It's just one example of using data. So let's talk about big data. Let's understand the difference. There are data engineers, there's data scientists, and there's data analysts. See, big data, in my opinion, is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they're doing it and they're doing it right. The skills needed to make decisions are important, right? When you talk about certifications and you talk about data scientists and engineers, you could take a picture of this. And I know Eric's going to, I'll get a copy of this to everybody who's joining this webinar. But there's a lot of information that is needed to actually dissect this data beyond just data and think about it as <clears throat> domain expertise. Contact centers are different than just data. And we'll talk about that. So like anything, I like to talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, which is the big hot button right now. And uh, this is a true story of, of, of me because I love to play with bots and I love to play with machine learning. So here's a, a live example of my post. And if you're not following me on Facebook, you can find me Instagram and LinkedIn. So everybody's aware my, my LinkedIn is more professional. My sarcasm and stuff comes out on Facebook and Instagram. So I posted this picture of a child, old age, you know, to reach old age of the wisdom, you had to be young and stupid. As you notice, the poor kid's got a little knife sticking in a wall socket. I don't know if you've ever done that, if anybody's ever done that, but I thought it was a funny meme right? Doesn't spread hate, doesn't spread in injury, but it was funny. Facebook didn't think it. It's against their community standards, as you see. So they took it down. Yes, I was in Facebook jail. So I appealed the decision, right? They also disagreed again and said it's against all of their um, community standards. And this is why. Then they restricted my account because of a kid with a knife. Can't go live for 18 days, et cetera. Again, just having some fun. Machine learning without human intelligence is not only censorship, but it's also wrong to run a business like that. And that's why we always talk about human intelligence is needed to manage these machines. So because I know how the machines work, I had to have some more fun. So I posted this meme, which by the way, went to everybody because obviously a bird can't kill anybody. I mean, that's pretty much the story of that. Hopefully you enjoyed that little bit. Let's get in and talk some data. So AI and speech analytics, everybody's talking about it. It's natural language processing using artificial intelligence and more importantly, human intelligence. When you use natural language processing, 
The human language is separated into fragments or unstructured data. That's where an engineer comes in to make sure it's accurate, it's contextual, and you're getting the context of what the conversation is versus keywords. Each word of an interaction is literally one piece of unstructured data. Here's a snapshot of 20 minutes of AI. If you see this, you'll see all of the categories. Each one of those uh, orange boxes is data. And that data reflects what you're going to do with the output. So when you talk about this big data, uh, everybody's talking about, like, what's the big deal? It's value, veracity, velocity. Um, again, I'm not going to bore you by reading each one of these, but I can tell you that um, in the contact center business, about 87% in the telco space are using it. It's about 76% roughly in finance and about 60% in healthcare are taking advantage of this information. So now I got all this big data. I understand it. I've analyzed it. Now what? I think what a lot of people miss is putting it together. Think of the Legos. I have children, so I've stepped on them plenty of times. Besides that pain point of stepping on a Lego, I, I just wanted to make it visually appealing. So basically, first, you got your data. And it's all scattered all over the place. The first step of it is sorting it by color. Then you're arranging it by pieces. Then you're visually presenting it. And some people use graphs and, and dashboards and stuff like that. But really, the holy grail of using data with purpose is explaining it with a story, which is building that house. So I just pulled a couple examples just to give you. So we created an algorithm called Key Performance Behavior Index. And I'll bring to your attention, it's similar to what you guys are looking at, scorecards, red, yellow, green. But if you look at the QA as a score, and that's in the blue right here, it, it doesn't look that bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. But when you apply that data with a key performance behavior dashboard, which is to the right, that's on a scale of one to zero to five. It's a two. So what it's telling me as an analyst to say, man, there's something wrong. While they're looking pretty good, there's a key performance behavior or benchmark in there that we're struggling with. And if you look at the bottom, you will see here in this screenshot, you see that one characteristic is only 40, 36%. That's a key metric. But because the agents are doing so great on everything else, a typical QA scorecard will miss that because they're looking at the aggregate of quality as a score. So um, Matt Rocco and myself published a book together um, about quality. And we talk about quality is not a score. It's a behavior. So that's why we talk about behaviors. And when you get this type of data, now you can actually get even better. You can analyze the data, you can look at behavioral metrics, and you can actually create scorecards for the effectiveness of the supervisor who's coaching the agents. So you can see here we have A, Bs, and Cs. And what this is doing is looking at three critical components um, or more, depending on how big the scorecards are, of, of what is actually making the impact to the bottom line and impact to the delivering of the customer experience. And when you have data like this and you actually extrapolate it with that domain expertise, it even gets better. So now you know who to coach, what to coach, and how to coach. In this particular example using data, we know for a fact that there was these are your objections and to the right are your rebuttals. So we know that every time someone says, man, thank you so much, I'm going to call you back or let me call you back later, that's an objection. OK, we know by creating urgency, you have a 42 percent chance in closing that sale, not because training told me, but because when you listen and analyze 100 percent of your interactions, you have a bunch of data and the data tells me the best of the best reps, the top of the top people are doing this at that objection. OK, and that's kind of what this looks like. And we built practical applications for our leaders and our coaches to what those objections and rebuttals should sound like. And we've actually seen in this particular case study, and I'll talk about another one towards the end, but this particular client saw a 2% lift in conversion rate, half a million dollars in incremental revenue over 90 days. 
and a bunch of other metrics that we can talk about it at a later date, but it basically tells you the data works. So we tell everybody, you have the tools, how do we use them? We've also talked about, we talk about inspection. How do I inspect? So one of the best demonstrated practices we found is most coaches are coaching, hopefully 80% of their time. But we've also said, you know what? There's got to be a better way for an agent to be coached on their own. So we introduced self-coaching. That's what you're seeing here. How many evaluations were done on the agent? Here's their supervisor. How many are the coaches doing? How many are the agents self-reviewing? And then we've actually deployed. This is a cool thing we've deployed. We actually give our, it's all online. So an agent could give us confidential feedback on how their coaching session was. When you take all this data and tie it together, right, you can actually improve not only sales performance, but improve that customer experience. Our analysts tell our ops people how to achieve the goals. So we use a Jahari window model. We actually tell you where's your biggest bang for your buck. And in this particular example, we talk about hold techniques, non-committal callbacks, um, we obviously, in our decks, we give them the links to the call so they can see it. But as well, we just give them predictive analytics because if we can fix 50% of this negative voice of customer sentiment, it'll increase your MPS score by 25%, right? Or by 25 points. So that's kind of what we do. You know, to summarize it and wrapping it up just a little bit before I get into some, some of the impacts, you know, data at scale is fair and balanced. It avo avoids gauging individual value based on just a small sample or a small section of really what's going on. I'm sure some of you guys listening are probably doing two, three, you know, coachings per agent per month, which is about 12 roughly. And an average agent takes anywhere from 800 to 1200 calls, depending on what line of business. So what we try to do is, you know, to, to help with attrition, we believe that most people come to, to our jobs, you build a culture, you give them the tools to be successful, you value them and make them part of it. And of course, last but not least, make it effortless for them. What we found when we deployed during COVID, because we had to put a bunch of people to remote, like you guys all did as well, I'm sure. During this remote, when a lot of people went remote, a lot of people weren't getting the coaching that they needed. So what we ended up doing was deploying this to the agent's desktop. So we made it effortless for the agents to actually look at some of those practical examples, look at job aids, assign coaching and assign training so they can self-select through training, take micro-learning labs from our LMS systems. And that's really what was happening. So let's talk about an impact of a, of a real case study. So in this one, we had a chat abandonment rate. When the customer came to us, one of the opportunities was they were abandoning over six, their other vendor was abandoning 60% of their chats. So by using all these tools that are at our disposal, during the first 60 days, we had the number went down to 7.9%. The next 30 days, it went to 1.14%. So it's basically telling you using the data the correct way, it actually works. Their voice of customer sentiment analysis was 62%. It increased 13% in 60 days. So now you're talking about speed to market, speed to answer, speed to fix. So when you look at the customer effort, Customer effort when started was about 15.17. Actually, after two months, it went down. So you look at the agent effort. It was hard for the agent to do their job because of the tools. We reduced that to 20%. Let's talk 12 months later. In 12 months, average abandoned time was eight and a half minutes, almost nine minutes. It's six seconds now. 43 minutes was their longest wait time. 11 minutes now is the longest. Average wait time, five minutes, down to 21 seconds. Total wait time, down to five. That's real money in your pocket. You can reduce all these things. That's real money. Service level was 29%, went to 88%. When you improve employee retention, in summary, there's cascading benefits when you're using data at scale to actually manage performance. You know, at, at our company, uh, um, what we look at is retention, attrition people talk about. We call it retention because retention is how many people are you keeping, which is flip it upside down for attrition. But what we found was when you do targeted coaching, encourage that self-learning, 
take quality beyond scores. Give them direct feedback. Involve the agents in that evaluation process so you're not dinging them for what they did wrong. You're literally trying to help them make more money, make them get career paths, move them up. And what we found is our, our retention rate is 93%, 92 can change globally. It makes sense, all the data I just shared with you in this little bit of time. But how do I convince everybody to talk about it? Well, you can reduce the amount of time it takes you to become a commissioned team member, number one. If you're on sales programs, if you tell agents what's in it for them and show them how you're going to give them the data that's valuable, accurate, and can improve them, they're all in. You control. No more gut feelings. No more, I think this is what's going on. When using analytics, you can actually understand to the micro level of what actually is happening. You understand what to say, when to say it, how to appeal to these customers because you're analyzing and listening. Your customers will tell you anything they want about your business. They'll tell you more than you probably want to know. But really, are we looking at quality as a score to what the agent did right, what they did wrong? Or are you listening to that conversation and getting information that can help you on process, people, channel switches, things like that, right? And then when you talk about fair and balanced, your, your ability is not gauged on a small sample set. I talk to people all the time in the industry and people are still listening to a handful of calls and it's just not real accurate data. <clears throat> so to wrap it up, before I get into some q and I have a few more slides, but you know, just to tell the storyline a little bit, bit, bit different. I wrote a detailed blog, blog on this. You're more than welcome to scan that QR code or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it'll take you to this blog. But building a data-influenced work culture, that's what we talk about today. Take a top-down approach, but align the data scientists who have domain expertise with your business. No disrespect on anybody who understands data or an IT guy who's deploying a new tech stack. But what, we, like what I say in my job is I'll say, when's the last time you listened to a call, Mr. IT guy? You, they solve problems. So I'm not knocking anybody in IT, but sometimes they solve problems that's really not a problem in operations. That's why we say align, align the data scientists and engineers with the actual domain expertise and operations. Make the process transparent. It's not about dinging them for what they did wrong. You're actually trying to make their job easier, their job better, and make that end agent more money. And then when you have all the data, don't analyze it just on the agents. Analyze it from all angles. Process improvement, right? IVR improvement, channel switching. If, if the call starts out in our call center, it says, I'm calling you because I was on your website and I tried to do this and I couldn't, that's a process. But typical quality operations people don't pick that up because it's outside their control. But analyzing that data again is huge when you understand it. So how do you use this data in day-to-day -day life, right? So if you're looking at the day-to-day -day life, the secret sauce, the science, the routines, the algorithms on the data of the equation, this magic potion under the hoods of these engines. In order to solve for these business challenges, you need to consolidate and correlate data that's produced in disparate operational resources. You're going here for QA. You're going here for dialer. You're going here for sales tracker. You have to go through five, six, seven different tech stacks. Then you might have one for phone, one for chat, et cetera, right? You know, what we've solved, this isn't reporting. This is actually descriptive and diagnostic analytics. And hopefully that demonstrated in that customer facing solution that incorporates the following. Sure, you can routine automate acquisition of flows of customers. You can make algorithms to interpret and access data values, right? You can harmonize, correlate the data between multiple channels, multiple uh, opportunities. And you can go on and on and on with that. Complex and bad data destroys integrity. It introduces risk and promotes bad, inaccurate decision-making. When you're on a call and someone says, that's just how Sally sounds. No, the data tells a story. The story is what you need to do. And a story is consumable 
and usable at every level of the organization. And since I'll age myself now, Don Vito was a big data guy. Think about it. He needed all the facts because his decisions were based on life and death. You can't whack someone with bad data, right? That would start a war. None of the bosses wanted a war back then. Wars cost money, right? So think about it as that way. Preventing blind spots that leads to this silo reporting. Data models that are customizable and metadata that gives you surgical output. Surgical meaning who, what, why, where, when, how to fix it. And translating that data in an intuitive, easy to use, understandable UI format and visualization is key. There's a lot of speech companies out there that have these fancy dashboards, 2 million data sets. I showed you 20 minutes worth of AI data. The problem with that, when you give it to somebody at the level of an agent or a coach who doesn't understand data science and data analytics, the problem there, it's overwhelming. And when's the last time you heard a coach say, yeah, I'm not sure. They're going to say, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm coaching to it. But they may not know about it. Last but not least, before I open it up to Q&A, um, use AI to determine the skills that matter. What's important? If your conversations and your coaches start with, I listen to a call, it's time for you to change the approach. I wrote another detailed blog here. Again, the, they're, they're there. Feel free to take it. It's free. There's no sales stuff in it. It's literally all about setting the goals, analyzing your data, prioritizing the ROI, how to deploy it, awareness, plan of action, and cross-functional collaboration. If you want to subscribe, I do put a lot of free content out on LinkedIn. Feel free to join me. You could uh, find me on LinkedIn, Jim Ayubor. There's a QR code there to subscribe to my newsletter. I'm not sending a bunch. I do one monthly newsletter. That's it. And usually it's around the analytics, operational performance, mostly ops type of information. Um, you know, as a 32-year veteran in the contact center, so you know I'm not a guy who read a book. Uh, I started my career as an agent, worked up. I ran operations for over a decade, uh, got into the CX suite and just saw so many opportunities to leverage it, not only for the agents, um, because obviously agents are important. Without them, none of us have a job. But more importantly, how do I bring additional value to our clients that they're probably not getting from a traditional call center who sends them a bunch of Excel spreadsheets that says how many calls I answered and what my, my service levels were? Hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of, of, of what we're going to. I'm happy to dig in anytime you guys want a little bit deeper. Uh, my information is right here. And with that being said, I'm going to open it up to my questions. Let me look at these chats. I got lots. While I truly understand, question one, while I truly understand the value and ability of data-driven decision-making, Do you feel that we're in danger of over discounting the value of gut decisions? Never. Here's my saying for you, Lindsay. Inspect, verify. Because what the data will tell you is a story. It doesn't mean, and that's the key about the human intelligence, right? Machines are not smart. Machines can replicate. They have no emotion. So it's always good to have that human being there. You never want to discount the value of a gut decision, but here's what you can do. If you have a gut feeling that everybody's or, or a problem with a process, what the data does for you is can go in and validate and verify that 20%, 30%, or 16%, your gut feeling is right. And the reason you do that is now you can go in and only target coach on those 20 people that the machine's telling you is not doing the process and pat the back on the rest of the 80% that are doing it. Hope that answered it. Question two, here in our utility industry, we use KPIs for analysis and forecasting and KPB similar to their purpose and application. Yes. So I have a lot of utility clients. Uh, happy to talk offline with that, but these can all be, I, I know that we, we know that space very well, right? And in your industry, uh, you're definitely using it for forecasting, which is predictive analytics, right? And then you're also using the benchmarks behavior on a couple of things. Saves, I would imagine would be one. Compliance, you don't want a PUC complaint. So those things are absolutely can be used there as well. Another one, how can you improve employee retention when they may be replaced by AI? 
So I wrote an article on this. You can find it on QA. I disagree with all the industry, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't think AI is replacing people. As an example, when I launched AI and speech to text at ETEC, I had about 200 analysts and scientists that were doing a lot of the manual evaluations like a QA team. When I launched speech and actually did it, that team has grown to over 500. So what you're doing is what AI will replace are simple things. Okay, um, is the shirt blue? Yeah, AI, a bot can handle that all day long. Okay, but more complex interactions are not gonna be handled by AI. And I know people are saying, have I seen ChatGPT? Absolutely, okay? But again, if you look at ChatGPT, it's only accurate up to 2021. I don't know if you looked at your calendar, but it's 2023. So any new events or any new things that are happening is not actually programmed in the machine. So I actually dis I disagree that um, it's all going to be replaced by AI. But there is a place for it, for sure. There's a place for automation. There's a place for agent assist. But more and more people are wanting to talk to human beings because the machines, again, when they're not programmed properly, are just a frustration, same as an IVR. Have you ever called some of these companies with IVRs? You can't get out of the IVR hell. It's in a loop. Hopefully that answered that question. Micromanagement seems to be commonplace. How would you resolve this? Yeah, so, so micromanagement is definitely commonplace. I try to get the buy-in from the agent of what, what's, in, what's in it for them. Because at the end of the day, I think it's about servant leadership and serving others first. I'm not doing this to tell you what you're doing wrong. I'm doing this to try to help you see the vision. And by the way, there is a percentage of the people in the call center who's doing this as a side gig or doing this just to make money or beer money if it's a college kid. I get it. Right. So when I talk about micromanagement, I'm not micromanaging you. I'm enabling you to be transparent and showing you all of the data. Most people, we're seeing plus 80% of our workforce like it. Granted, there's always those problem childs. We have those. Those are probably don't waste as much time. They're going to self-select anyways, or they're not going to meet their goals. So either way, it's a win-win. We don't consider it micromanaging them by giving them all this data. And by the way, when we go to our agent and see 2,000 opportunities for him, we don't give them all 2,000. We look at the top three and do the same type of coaching, except it's like this. Hey, Lindsay, I listened to 100 of your calls. Here are the three things I want to talk about. It's the same message, same, same scenario you're getting, but I'm not hitting you with, I found 85,000 issues with your calls. Listen, I listened to 100 calls, which is the data is telling me. I got three things I want you to work on. So it's similar to what we would normally do. Hey, I listened to this call, but... Because the problem when you listen to a call is, oh, I had a bad day. This was going on. This... You know, it, it removes that because it, it's volume. Question five, is it feasible to invest in big data tools in a small business? Yes, depending on a couple of things. When you define small business, small, small businesses, I have customers as low as 10 agents and 15 agents who use data. Yeah, I don't think you have to ingest a million pieces of data with somebody as small as that. What it does for you in a small business is gives you the outliers quicker. So my recommendation is if you are going to look at a tool for that, you want to go in. You don't want to take 100% of your call volume forever because it's small. You want to buy a bucket. And then what you do is you go in and you analyze 100% first 30 days. You get all your outliers. You start getting the plan. Next 30 days is all about coaching, developing, working. Then you could bring that ingestion down because now you're in spot check. I do the same with big customers as well, by the way. But a small business absolutely is worth it, especially if there's a compliance issue, any fines related. Any, um, I can tell you the easiest ROI in the world, whether you have five agents or 5,000, is if you're doing any type of sales or saves, because that's real money. What's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in trying to engage their customer service agents and how did they get past it? Probably the biggest mistake is that I've seen in our, in not just our industry, in our industry, but I've seen a lot of people, they buy a tool and they think it's going to be Ron Papel's rotisserie. And again, I'm aging myself. It's not set it and forget it. People talk about this analytics and AI as plug and play, and it's not. It's a machine like anything is taught by a human being. Make no mistake about it. ChatGPT was not invented one day. It took years and years of programming and engineers to actually program those things to understand the data. 
That's the biggest mistake. They think they can just plug and play. How do you anticipate the customer data analytics field is going to evolve over the next couple of years? Great question. So when I look at customer data, here's what I'm hearing from our customers. Our customers are saying, I've never seen data like this. I wish I had this on my competitors. <laughs> so to answer your question, I think it's going to be game changing because now when you use predictive and prescriptive analytics, now you're telling a story. Yeah, my service levels are good. Here's this. But my customers are leaving me. The reason they're leaving you is because of a process. They went to the website, tried to do X. Your website does not allow it. That's a problem. And by the way, you had 8,242 interactions telling you that they came to your phone channel because your chat rep couldn't do it. Your social media couldn't do it. That's where I see that data analytics field going to evolve over the next couple of years. And I think what you're going to find, um, one quote I've, I've talked a long time ago. I've told customers this since 2001. It's not your choice to tell your customer how to contact you. It's theirs. If I'm paying for a service, you got to give me all options. That means I can chat, I can call, I can email. It's my choice, not yours. Second thing, when you look at that data, you can actually analyze it to improve processes. You can put bots up on front for the most frequently asked questions. If somebody in the retail space is coming in, how, does this shirt come in blue? No reason that should go to a call center because it's taken 45 seconds to answer the call, two minutes to validate you to see who you are. And then it's all about, was this blue? Those are where the things I think. The last thing I would tell you is where I see it going. Um, I'm sure everybody shops on Amazon. Um, Amazon has a bunch of recommendations. They're all recommendations. And you know, when you log in, you see, hey, you looked at this, you should look at this. That's all machine learning. That's all that is. But here's what you might not know. There's over 1,200 data scientists sitting at Amazon actually coding those machines. Matter of fact, you go to their website. Last I looked, it was a few months ago. There's 424 job postings for that particular skill set. So back to the other person about replacing it. No, it's going to sharpen your skill set, sharpen your tools. But that's really what is going to be done. That was all the questions I had time for. Um, anything else I can help you with, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My last name is Ayub. There's not a lot of us out there. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Happy to talk. I've got a lot of content out there. Um, I thank you, Eric. Thank you for the TMR I really appreciate everybody's time and effort. You all have a blessed day. And thank you again for letting me speak. Thanks, Jim, for that excellent keynote. I want to thank everyone else in the audience for joining us today as well. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. This officially concludes the Argyle CX UX for B2B Leadership Forum. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Sprinkler. Thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. Have a great rest of your day.